Hello, uh, I'm Joe Bita, and I'm really excited to be here uh, talking with you all at Dapper Day. Unfortunately, this is a pre-recorded talk. We couldn't make the schedules work, but uh, hopefully everybody has a, has had a wonderful uh, day and a lot of good talks, and hopefully I can add something to the conversation. Now, a little bit about my history. For those who don't know, I'm one of the folks that got Kubernetes up and running. Uh, uh, gosh, 10 years ago now, which is crazy to think about. Uh, prior to that, I started Google Compute Engine. Um, and, uh, and then I was at Microsoft for quite a while working on uh, starting out IE from like IE4 to IE6. And then uh, uh, some of what became Windows Presentation Foundation. Uh, uh, Avalon was the code name at the time. So as you can see, developer platforms are really in my DNA. It's been something that it's been part of my career for as long as I've had a career. And um, and so coming into this and talking with some other folks, uh, I started thinking like, hey, it'd be great to pull together a lot of the ideas, a lot of the thinking around what makes a good developer platform. And so with, uh, with no further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so first off, for me, I think the key defining thing of a platform at least from a platform builder's point of view, is it allows users to do things that you never even imagined. Uh, I think good platforms are these launch pads where people can take it in directions, explore their creativity, and, and, and really build applications that were outside of what you considered when you were building the platform itself. And, and, and as a platform builder, as somebody who's worked with developers, that's really one of the most exciting and gratifying things about the whole experience. It's always great to see the creativity of, of the user base of the community in terms of where they take things to the next level. Um, and good platforms encourage and enable that. So now as I was sitting down to do this talk, I, I, I started brain dumping all the aspects of what I think makes a uh, a good platform, and I shared it with some colleagues too, and they added some things, and and um, and here's at least you know a, a starting point of some of the aspects uh, in my mind that you need to consider uh, in terms of what makes a good platform. I am positive that some of you folks in the audience, you have things that are really important to you that you think are important to a platform that probably aren't on this list. I think this is one of the challenges as we build platforms is that there's so many competing concerns. There's so many things that you wanna make sure that you bring together and get right. And even if you know that something's right, there is no one right answer oftentimes for every platform. A lot of times there are really difficult and subtle trade-offs to be made. Um, you know, the, the, the broad strokes is that oftentimes you have to make a decision between something that is easy to use, easy to approach, and something that is very capable and, uh, and oftentimes maybe a little bit harder to use. Um, and finding the right balance there, the right ways to finesse around some of these, these problems, uh, some of these challenges, is really what can make the difference between a, a, you know, a, a, an okay platform and an excellent platform. So with that in mind, um, I've bolded some of them. It's kind of hard to tell here, but some of the things that I want to start giving a deeper dive in, and we'll go through those today, there's more here than I can take care of uh, in one uh, quick 15-minute talk. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll share a uh, QR code to a longer document that really lays out some of these ideas in more, uh, uh, in more detail. And it's something that maybe can become a living document where where other folks can take it and add to it, and we can uh, and we can really sort of collect the institutional knowledge of folks who've built different platforms in different contexts. So the first thing I want to talk about is this idea of of what I like to think about toolkits versus frameworks, and I think this is in broad strokes a spectrum of different types of platforms. On the one hand, you have um, what I would call toolkits. So these are essentially a bunch of building blocks, but it's really left as an exercise to the developer to take these things, construct them, bring them together, and make an application out of it. 
On the other hand, you have something that is, you know, what I like to call a framework. This is where there's a lot more opinion that comes into play. There's a lot more of this is the right way to do it. You'll hear words like idiomatic as you start talking about this. I think a canonical example, and it's actually in the names, would be Ruby on Rails, right? The on Rails aspect of it is really speaks to it being a framework. Uh, oftentimes, I like to think of frameworks as... Um, as you know, there's some place either literally or metaphorically where there's a comment that says insert code here and you can get a lot of impact with a little bit of code oftentimes with frameworks. Um, and again, this is one of those places where you see a trade-off between flexibility and ease of use. Oftentimes toolkits are harder to approach, but you can do so much more with them, whereas frameworks are much more constrained, but much easier to get started with. Uh, I think a great example here uh, would be something like, say, jQuery versus React. jQuery is very much a toolkit, whereas if you look at something like React, it's very much more in the framework way of doing things. Now, where would I put Dapper on this? And I think it's an interesting thing because there's parts of Dapper that are very opinionated. The way that you talk to services or between services, um, the way that you configure it, you know, that, that stuff starts to look very much like a framework. There's a lot of opinion there. There's the right way to do it, things are going to work a lot easier if you stay within, you know, color within a certain set of lines there. <clears throat> now, that being said, there's a bunch of aspects of your application that are really outside the purview of Dapper. Dapper is really sort of this substrate in a lot of ways for communicating between services and to uh, various capabilities. But what's happening inside your application, even down to what language it's written in, is actually uh, very much open-ended. And so there's some aspects of Dapper that I think, you know, from my understanding, is, is more of a toolkit. And then there's other aspects of Dapper that are much more on the framework side of things where there's a lot more opinion. Now, this is actually, you know, um, predictability is so important when it comes to platforms. And I think one of the things to recognize here is that oftentimes platforms start small uh, and then they grow over time as you add more and more capabilities. In addition, oftentimes, users or developers will approach the platform and and come at it from one very specific need. They have a problem that they want to solve. They're going to get started with that. And there may be all sorts of capabilities that come into the platform that they don't care about to begin with. And as people start working with these things, they're going to build an understanding of how do things work in this platform? What is the sort of the, the way to do things in this platform? And they're going to build an intuition around that. And so predictability is important because as people start using more and more of the platform, you want that experience, you want that intuition that they learn in one corner of the platform to be applicable across the rest of the platform. Um, this really reduces cognitive load for the developer and it makes easier, it makes it so much easier for them to really get more and more value without actually having to learn everything all over again. So for me, I think a good example of this, you know, and, and, and you know, a little bit of patting ourselves on the back, I think, is, is Kubernetes. Um, every Kubernetes object has, you know, con, uh, 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 metadata um, and then spec and status with this controller model that gets reused many, many different places in many different ways. And that idea that you can learn, oh, this is how an object works and then apply that across different domains, whether you're talking compute or storage or, um, or networking and bringing all those things together with a consistent model. That's something that I think is really, really powerful. And it's one of the things that I think people like about Kubernetes is that consistency. Um, this extends to things like usages of labels. And we're starting to see, um, say, I think Knative has done a, a great job here of, of introducing new ideas like what they call duck typing, where you have parts of the object that are common patterns across different usages that you can write generic code against. Um, and then things like conditions, which is another one of these patterns. Um, a place where I think this hasn't been done well, and uh, I don't want to be too critical here, but I think would be AWS. I think AWS is amazing. You go and and there's you know a gazillion services. There's so much that you can do, but because of the way that Amazon operates with you know 
two pizza teams and a lot of, of independence and autonomy for these teams is that you don't get a lot of consistency or predictability across different parts of Amazon. When you learn how you deal with S3, for example, there's not a lot of transferable knowledge or intuition that you can then apply to how you deal with, say, something like EC2. And I think this is one of those things that as AWS has grown, um, has really, you know, become a problem for users. There is so much to learn there that there, you know, there there is a, a difficulty in terms of understanding the common patterns across across Amazon. All right, so another, you know, related thing here is what I would call layering. Um, so oftentimes, you'll have the typical use for a system will be very simple. Um, it'll be really easy, um, and uh, but once you start using this, once you understand some more complicated concerns, there's a whole lot more going on under the, the covers that you're going to want to be able to deal with and configure and handle. Um, and so for me, a, a great example here would be load balancing. I think conceptually, when you're setting up a distributed service and you want to have a load balancer in front of it, it's very easy. Request comes in, pick a back end, send it to that back end. How hard could it be, right? Well, it turns out that it is actually really hard. And if you start looking at some of the concerns here, you may want to actually make a routing decision based on you know, the HTTP path at the front end, or maybe based on the region that the thing is coming from, or based on you know the, the, the type of method that it is. Um, uh, similarly, you may want to have different sets of back end and do things like A-B testing across these things. You may want to go through and, um, you know, uh, have a way to drain uh, some of those servers that you're pointing the load balancer at. This stuff starts getting really, really complicated. And so the challenge as a platform builder is, you know, and this is a, a pearlism, Larry Wall, um, you want to make the easy things easy and the hard things possible. And that's really, really hard to do. The default way, you know, for a lot of folks is to go through and think about the most complex case, build an API, build an experience that can handle those complex cases, only to find that you made the whole thing super unapproachable for more pedestrian, more uh, uh, getting started types of cases. And so that's something that I think as a platform builder, you have to be able to balance. Now, when we're talking about language bindings, uh, languages often have a lot of abstractions, you know, whether it's containment or object or like whatever, that help you to deal with building this different type of layering for how these things work. Um, when it comes to network type APIs, RESTful APIs, um, we don't have the same tool set that I think we do when it, uh, the, in, in languages. Um, and this is why in Kubernetes, um, things like CRD, and the controller patterns are ways to start creating abstractions that don't necessarily hide the underlying complexity, but provide tools to help you start to approach it and deal with it. Um, and so that flexibility, that layering, that composition is a really powerful tool and worth thinking about. Um, now, when it comes to uh, Dapper, layering and composition is common. I think, you know, for example, and, and you know, this is my, I'm not a Dapper expert, <laughs> but something like if you take state and messages, that becomes outbox, right? An outbox abstraction. Um, state plus invocation becomes actors. And so you have these composable pieces that you can put together to build higher level patterns. Now, this is something that, you know, oftentimes gets short shrift uh, documentation. Um, a lot of times uh, uh, you're so busy building stuff, you're excited about it, the documentation will lag. Um, and this can become a real drag on the users of your, uh, of, of your platform. Um, and, you know, and I think not all documentation will work, work for all people. Um, for me, I like this idea, this conception of, of there are some developers that are what I would call depth developers, where they want to go deep on topics. They want to under, understand the core concepts and how those things work. And then there's other developers that are breath. They want to understand the broad strokes about how things work, but they're really task oriented and they want to get things done. And the truth is, is that you have to have different documentation for different sets of users because they're going to come at you with looking for different things. And there really is no one set of documentation that that's going to meet everybody everybody's needs all of the time. Um, 
And so, uh, um, so there's this, this effort called Divio. I'm not an expert on it, but one of my colleagues pointed it out to me and they actually break it down further way. They, they think about two dimensions, practical versus theoretical. Um, and then studying versus working. So I think that studying is like, hey, I really want to understand it. Working is I'm task oriented. I want to get something done. And then some of it is concrete versus more of like, hey, what are the concepts that we're thinking about? And so Dapper does a great job of really focusing on both the quick start, getting started, task oriented, but then also laying out the core concepts so that users can get a deeper understanding of how the system works, where that consistency is, and how to make the best use of the underlying Dapper system. And then finally, the last topic that I wanna to talk about here is what I call the platform builder's curse. Um, and this is really about being pragmatic. Um, things are valuable only if they're used. And it's so easy as a platform builder to build for some theoretical user, you know, uh, uh, if you build it, they will come type of thing. And, and the reality is that it's easy to build for a user that doesn't exist. And so the, the key here is to make sure that you get real input for, from real users and use that to help guide the platform that you're building good platforms end up being a conversation between the platform builders and the users. And, you know, hey, what do you think about this? Oh, I'm using it this way. Oh my goodness, you're doing that? I never thought about that before. Let me go ahead and make it easier to do that inside of the platform. That, that, that push and pull, that, 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 that tug of war between the platform builders and the users is super healthy. And it's a great way to make sure that you get that sort of new energy and new ideas that make the platform better and better over time. And so the trap here that you wanna avoid is, is being so scared of exposing your platform to users that you don't actually listen to them, that you don't learn from them. And so, you know, my experience both with developer platforms and beyond is that oftentimes when you're shipping something, if you're not embarrassed about what you're shipping, you're waiting too long to ship it. And so as a platform builder, you wanna be a little bit embarrassed about what you're shipping because that's the only way that you can get it out there and start getting that feedback and making sure that you're building the right thing. So with that, I wanna thank you for uh, letting me talk at you for about 15 minutes or so. Um, here's a, uh, some QR codes with uh, a document version of this that goes into more detail. And then also feel free to connect with me on Blue Sky and, um, um, and we can continue the conversation there. I'll post some of these, uh, these uh, the document version and these slides up there if you're interested with it also. Uh, with that, thank you. And, um, you know, I'm so excited about Dapper and where you all are going. And uh, yeah, thank you so much.